Welcome, welcome everyone. This is kind of our uh, you know KubeCon uh, open kind of you know session with the TOC. Uh, they'll do introductions uh, of who they are, and then we'll kind of go through the kind of the basics of how the organization works from a TOC uh, perspective. Uh, and then we'll kind of just open it up to the audience for questions. Uh, people always have questions regarding how do things work, how do you, how do I submit a project, and and so on. So um, we'll start. First, with introductions. So, my name is Chris Anizek. I have the fun job of being a CTO uh, of, of the organization and work closely with the TOC. Uh, maybe we'll start from left to right with, with Katie and go uh, from. Oh, no. No, it's on. Hello. Can people hear me? Oh, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> you can hear me. Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Katie Gomanji, and currently I'm working as a senior field engineer for Apple. I have many roles in the community, including the TOCs. Um, looking forward to your questions. I'm Dave Zalatuski. I'm an engineer on the platform team at Spotify, and uh, I'm on the TOC in the end user seat, and I do a bunch of work with Backstage. Richie, uh, working at Grafana Labs, uh, Prometheus team, governing board, TOC, a uh, few other things. <laughs> Emily Fox, I'm a security engineer at Apple, TOC, security tag, co-chair emeritus, KubeCon co-chair with Ricardo and Jasmine, and a lot of other stuff in the open source community. Right, so I'm Ricardo, I'm a computer engineer at CERN, and um, I'm also in the TOC mm -hmm. since uh, just over a year as an end user representative as well. I also co-lead the CNCF Research User Group, so I invite everyone to go check that out as well, and I'm co-chairing uh, KubeCon Europe with Emily. Hi, uh, my nickname is Dims. Uh, you can usually see me in Kubernetes channels. Um, I'm here, part of the TOC, and first among equals, I'm the chair here. Uh, so, thank you. Yay. And obviously we have some folks that uh, are not able to, yeah. to, to fully, and fully attend. We have election process going on for well, one more. We will uh, get to that uh, eventually. So quick little uh, you know, intro for you know, a lot of folks. Um, CNCF mission is all about making cloud native computing uh, ubiquitous. And the TOC is essentially our technical board that helps set the overall kind of vision and helps ensure that projects are cared for, advised for, uh, and, and, and so on. The way the CNCF is structured, uh, if you're not familiar with you know, open source foundations, there's generally a board of directors, sometimes there's you know, technical project leads and so on. The way it's done in CNCF at least is there's three main pillars. There is the governing board, which is kind of your boring business uh, you know, budget kind of decision makers. Uh, these are generally the companies that um, will pay to sustain the organization. So like your IBMs, Googles, Oracles, Apples of the world, and they get basically a vote on how kind of budget is kind of spent across the organization. You have the TOC, which is, you know, here represented here today. They focus on accepting projects, advising projects, potentially dealing with, you know, issues when it comes to, you know, conflicting projects and, and, and so on. Uh, they are basically the technical leadership advisors uh, of the organization. And then we have the end user community, which is a group of end user companies, not vendors, that kind of share practices and work together. And they also get to nominate uh, people to sit on the technical board. And these things are overlapping, but distinctly fired wall, firewalled off from each other. So just because you have a board seat on the governing board because you pay maybe for a seat, you necessarily don't have the ability to influence technical decisions. And that's kind of our best practice of you know, separating the business side of the house from the technical um, uh, side of the house. And we have 11 members that exist uh, in, in this TOC. So uh, other things um, you know, for folks that are new to the organization, uh, the TOC a while ago came up with a set of principles that kind of guide how they work as an organization. Um, you know, highly recommend folks to kind of go over this if they've never seen this before, but the simple idea is being project centric. Um, you know, uh, projects are essentially self-governing. The TOC doesn't necessarily meddle in the matters of projects. They, they work out on their own. Um, we're not a standards body. Uh, you know, there's uh, no kind of slow traditional standard body processes within um, CNCF. Uh, there is not a one size fits all. Uh, there is, uh, we, they aren't, we aren't king makers also. And we, what, what that essentially means is we allow for competing and overlapping projects. If you kind of see in the 120 plus projects we have now, there are projects that, you know, 
overlap a little bit in the service mesh space. There's probably at least five, six, maybe seven. I don't know. There's, there's a lot of service meshes we have these days. There's a lot of security related projects that kind of overlap and compete a little bit. Um, that dynamic is meant to happen. It, it's healthy. Competition breeds innovation and better, you know, solutions potentially for and and and, and users. Um, a lot of people always ask, like, why don't you just have one project of anything? That's not how we work or how we were structured to go about. We want to allow that competition to flourish. And overall, the TOC is really there to kind of truly help help projects and not interfere with with their day to day. Um, Moving on, um, the way kind of things are structured, uh, you have the 11 person uh, body up here and the way the kind of TOC divvies out work to the community is structured usually through these things called technical advisory groups or they used to be known as uh, SIGs previously uh, when we had to rename them due to the confusion caused between the Kubernetes SIGs and, and, and our tags here. And they're generally broken up by specific categories. So whether it's, you know, security, storage, um, you know, observability, and so on. So if you're very new to the community and you would love an opportunity potentially to be on the TOC, generally getting involved in one of these tags is a kind of a great first step. Um, not everyone is a domain expert in security or observability, networking, and so if you have something to contribute, it's a great place to kind of get in those tags, and the TOC leverages uh, those tags for advice, especially if they may not have particular expertise, and also just scale their, their workload uh, at the end of the day. Um, how do projects work in CNCF? There's three levels. I'm sure people have seen the crazy landscape and so on, but generally the way projects are broken up in CNCF is by what we call maturity levels. You have sandbox, which is meant to be very early stage, uh, generally a very low barrier to entry. Uh, to get uh, as a sandbox project, you just have to meet minimum bars around, you know, IP due diligence and, and like, you know, code of conduct, roadmap, and all this kind of basic things. Incubation is kind of the next level where you're a little bit more mature. You may have a little bit more diversity in terms of companies and organizations contributing uh, to the project. And then graduation, which is kind of the stamp of approval from the TOC that this is something that's going to be around for a while. It's not necessarily going to go away. You could definitely bet your uh, business on it. And then it's kind of this process that we've kind of come up with historically an organization to kind of give guidance um, to, uh, to, to end users. Um, to apply and submit a project, um, generally uh, the pathways are, we mostly recommend people to start a sandbox. That's generally meant for the kind of early stage and first kind of stage projects. It's a very simple Google form that you fill out with basic details and then the TOC reviews them I'll say like once, once or twice. Uh, yeah, one, oh yeah, one every two months. Basically, is kind of the the rough uh, cadence. You could also apply through incubation pathways. Um, you know, we've had projects like Knative and Istio go that, but that's a, a little bit longer uh, pathway to get to. But those are more mature projects um, uh, at the end of the day. Um, so we'll go through a little bit more, and then I'm gonna you know open up and ask some questions for the TOC, and then we'll just kind of open it up to everyone to have an opportunity to. Uh, ask, you know, why they're, whatever questions, why their project wasn't accepted and, and so on. So, um, <laughs> to, to, yeah, yeah. Oh, why, why, why was my sandbox uh, project not accepted? Uh, Richie didn't like it. So, um, you know, so these are some just kind of, you know, uh, ideas, but, you know, the, the, the question I'll kind of start off with before, you know, allowing the audience to kind of open up is, you know, we, we have 128 or seven, whatever, you know, projects in, in, in the CNC. It covers all sorts of, of aspects of, of cloud native computing, and we kind of expanded that over the years. If you look at the uh, the landscape that we have in CNCF, uh, huge, multiple categories. You know, we're almost seven years in the evolution of this organization. W what is missing? What, what, what's next, essentially? What, what, what needs to be fill, filled in potentially that currently is not there, or what potentially needs to be consolidated? So basically, my question to you is, you know, what do you think kind of the future missing gaps that still need to be filled in the organization over the next, you know, six to 12 um, months? Anyone could, can, okay. you know, could start. My personal answer would be more integration, um, okay. also more open standards, because uh, we have this huge breadth of, of projects. And one of the things which I hear again and again and again, and I think most of you will, is that people are confused about how to do things and where to get started and where to go to the next step. And we have all those really, really great tools, uh, but the integration between them is not super great. One of the ways to solve this is similar to IDF or ISO, 
open standards mm -hmm. and then have everyone implement against those standards because then you have interoperability and then you can build integrations on top of these and make more glue code. Anyone else to take a chance to answer the question? No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, I think interoperability has been a very important mm -hmm. factor for cloud native. Um, it has been happening from the beginning. Uh, if you look at Kubernetes, there are a lot of interfaces that uh, allowed us to integrate different networking and runtime components. So that was always a factor. And I think continue kind of uh, building on top of that is going to be quite important for our community. Um, in terms of the missing technologies, I. Uh, <laughs> Um, I think this is like a long-term strategy for, uh, well, Emily can maybe talk more about this one, but security is a very important factor. Um, we're not talking about adoption at the bleeding edge anymore. We're talking about enterprises looking into adopting cloud native, and they need to be secure. They need to be insured over and over again. That this is safe to run in production, and you can actually build your business on top of it. And I think that's definitely something which gained a lot of momentum. Um, and another thing that I come kind of would like to emphasize is we have a lot of tools. Uh, we have a lot of tools to do our like basic infrastructure. We have observability. Uh, we have continuous deployment. Um, however, um, we still need to improve how we optimize these tools. It's not just about integrating something. It's about how can we optimize this on top. So I think interoperability is still going to be a very important factor with that. But um, if you look at, for example, the CNCF landscape, if you look at the observability side, you will see that there is like a new range of uh, companies focusing on continuous optimization. And this is something um, that has like billions of dollars in investment at the moment. So this is quite new, um, but definitely something to keep an eye on. So that's my take. I can take next, but I'll actually quote Dave, because since I joined the TLC, there's something that sometimes keeps coming back, which is from an end user perspective, how do you build your stack? How do you make choices? And there's, there's a topic that came back a couple of times, and we never really got to like a, um, a good answer yet. Mm -hmm. I think it's something to come, which is this idea of like having something like reference stacks and mm -hmm. how, where do people choose? Why, why do, would people choose one product? and how do, why this stack instead of another one? What, what fills your needs? I think it's something that the TOC can also work on contributing together mm -hmm. with the tags. Yeah. I want uh, David to finish the talk on the end, from the end user point of view. Yeah. <laughs> Sure, yeah, I don't know if there's too much more to add. I mean, I think from this point of view, Rich, Richie kind of stole the thing I was going to say, and then Ricardo built on it, where as an end user, you say, let's let's go cloud native, and then you look at this 128 project landscape, and like Chris said, a bunch of them are seven or eight projects, and you don't want to evaluate eight projects to figure out which one works best for you, and then evaluate eight more in a different piece of the stack, and then find out that those two don't really work well together. So then you figure out which one of the, st the categories you want to use the second best one in because they do work well together. So this kind of combination of knowing what stacks work, having open standards interoperability, and having some understanding of which projects kind of do what and which ones I like work well together really goes a very long way for end users. And the, the next thing I was going to say, of course, was security. <laughs> so I don't need the microphone. <laughs> The right person is. Okay, so let's talk about security. It wouldn't be this kind of conference without it. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on in the security space throughout this conference. There's a ton of talks covering supply chain security, open source security. Um, one of the things that I've seen within the security tag community and several other open source security mm -hmm. communities is secure defaults and how difficult that conversation actually is, especially if you're an open source project where you're intended to be adopted by end users, potentially even vendors. And a lot of that is really industry vertical based. So I see a lot of need for projects partnering with the different industry verticals, such as healthcare, fintech, government, all of those, to understand what their assurance requirements are and to start developing secure by default configurations based off of your assurance requirements, whether or not you're low and like you're not going to be dealing with healthcare or personally identifiable information, or if you are a high insurance where people's lives actually depend on high uptime, resiliency, the confidentiality of the data. So this is, this is one of those large spaces. And then taking a further step back, it's 
what are the secure development pipelines of all of our CNCF and open source projects? How should they be looking? There's a lot of different requirements, and Salsa has been kind of leading the way in what secure software development looks like. But we need to get that across the ecosystem and get a lot of our projects on board. Uh, hi. Um, so th there is a <laughs> hi, Rich. <laughs> so uh, there's a couple of things that I would like to see as well. Uh, which hasn't been covered yet. Uh, one of those is like, you know, a, a cluster, Kubernetes cluster is a unit. Uh, how do we uh, make multiple Kubernetes clusters work together? How do you, uh, you know, manage them? How do you set policies? Uh, we tried a few things like QFED1, QFED2, but then now we are on to doing newer um, things. And there are multiple projects in the space uh, that we would like to go look at and see how they span clusters, uh, and not just span, clouds, uh, span clusters across cloud providers and even to the edge, right? Uh, networking becomes a challenge, storage becomes a challenge, just pulling the images becomes a challenge. Uh, so I would like to look at those areas to see what is the new in innovation and try to figure out if we can do some of those here. Uh, that is what I would like to look at. Also. There's always cutting edge stuff that we've been wanting to do. Like, you know, we, at one point we said, okay, serverless is the cutting edge, so let's do serverless, right? So, and then uh, Knative is coming to, uh, came into mm -hmm. us. And so there are other things like Wasm related stuff is happening, Rust related stuff is happening in the community. Like, how do we welcome them into the cloud native world? Mm -hmm. And how will they fit into the things that we are doing, right? And it can't be just the, Kubernetes is the only solution here, so we need to go figure out like, what is there anything else that we can do based on the knowledge, information, and things that we have, uh, you know, got from how we are building Kubernetes, running Kubernetes, and to see what are the other projects that we could be doing, and especially what are the other things that we could be doing that will explode with ecosystem building projects similar to the success we've had with Kubernetes as well. So those are the, some of the things that I would like to think about. Awesome, I'll kick it back to me. So uh, one more question before opening it up to fo uh, folks in the audience. Um, so developer experience, huge uh, kind of problem depending which projects uh, you know use. You know, I'm a pretty terrible, you know, engineer. But things like Prometheus, actually, very easy for you know even me to kind of get started. You know, and work with Kubernetes, a little bit more difficult depending which you know which way you go. You know, K3s or everything. What are your thoughts of like what we could do as a, a community from a TOS perspective to ensure that projects have like a baseline uh, improved developer uh, experience for especially new folks in the community to get started? Because e even though like Kubernetes has made so much strides to make things significantly easier to get started, it's still right. difficult for uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of folks. And then we have other projects that, you know, something like Falco, it's like good, that it, it's hard. Good luck. Yeah, like, yeah. So, so it's like, right. I would love to kind of hear people's uh, so the, thoughts of how we could improve this. So if this. you take one of these yeah. things, you will see a class of things, yeah. right? Like, for example, if you talk about security policy, uh, then you have OPA and you yeah. have Kiverno and things. And if you have CNI, then there is a set of things uh, that are yeah. kind of standard. They work kind of similar fashion. So, uh, but there are de facto standards that end up that we end up building, or we collaborate with multiple communities and get them to go together lockstep, so it becomes easier for the end user to adopt, like open telemetry that we were talking about. So I like to give this to Richie, so he can complete the thought on observability, since, since you asked about Prometheus. I don't think this is mainly about Prometheus. Maybe the one thing about Prometheus and Kubernetes, mm. for those who don't know those, were like the first, first two projects, and it's kind of a little bit cheating, because Borg and Borgmon share history, <laughs> so Prometheus and Kubernetes share history, but they are super well integrated with each other, so they uplift each other, and mm. that's one of those mm. things where you can see that early integration mm. keeps paying forward forever. Mm. Uh, as to the actual question, yeah. uh, hire 10 tech writers, hire two people who mm. just do CI, CD, and stuff for mm. the projects, because mm. speaking as the second largest project, mm. like the second uh, project mm. within CNCF and pretty much everything mm. is second uh, after mm. Kubernetes. Kubernetes has its own resources. Mm -hmm. That is not the case within CNCF across mm. the projects. Mm. So the thing which I see again and again 
and again, and for those who don't know, I'm the uh, developer seat on the governing board. Uh, and that's part of my platform, what I want to actually try and do. Mm -hmm get all the toil and all the janitorial work out of the project's way so mm -hmm. they can actually focus on the code because they are the subject matter experts at code. They're mm -hmm. not the subject matter experts at writing good documentation or mm -hmm. having good grammar or finding out that there's this one gap. They can mm -hmm. work with those people or if we move to a new uh, mm -hmm. thing where CNCF gets mm -hmm. cheaper cloud credits, mm -hmm. yeah. like it's on the projects to migrate. It's not that CNCF is like, okay, yeah. here's this new thing, we'll migrate it for you, we'll be done in a week or in two months, doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Everyone's getting generate S bombs now, yeah. right? So another thing to put on. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> they're back three. <laughs> So I just want to echo exactly what you said. Um, we can't expect software engineers to write excellent documentation mm -hmm. for other software engineers to read. So just making sure that you're taking the time to document and keep track of why you're making some of these design decisions or what? Testing, what? testing, we lost you? I think we lost. Oh, Good? okay, now it's back. Right. Um, <laughs> so part of it is making sure that the things that you're doing, you're making clear to your audience, mm -hmm. and because not everybody is a senior staff level software engineer, um, they're going to be folks that are more junior level, and you have to take the time to bring them along the path with you, because if you leave that community and you're trying to get more contributors or more mm -hmm. software engineers to assist, if you didn't bring them along and explain those design decisions to them, they're going to be lost and they're not going to be able to carry the project forward. Anyone, anyone else? Cool. All right, we have about uh, you know 10, 15 minutes, and feel free to open up questions. To uh, I think we have a microphone in the middle, I guess, over there. So if anyone wants to ask questions, don't be shy. It's not. It's very rare to get the. TOC in one place. Uh, also, if for you sure. want to, you can, Josh, you can just grab it, ask yeah, yeah, it, or here. Yeah, give yeah. it to the next person so we have a runner. Yeah, we're in a tough situation where we have limited <laughs> mics. <laughs> or you just go there, both right. Okay, or yeah, form a, you could form a line and kind of go. Uh, onto it. Hi, Joe. <laughs> <Okay>. Hi, y'all. <laughs> so I have a question. Yeah. So the, the original mission, and I love that you all started with what is the mission yeah. of the CNCF yeah. and the TOC. It all hinges on the definition of cloud native, and I know that there is an official definition of cloud native, but that's still open for participation. Mm -hmm. So I think so much of what the TOC do does really hinges on that sort of, I know it when I see it with respect to cloud native. So like, I guess, you know, have there been, you know, do you each, you know, do you have your own sort of spin in terms of what you think of when you say, when you see cloud native, what does it mean for you? And how does that influence the, the, the decisions that you make on the TOC? Uh, Joe, thanks for this question. So we struggle this every time we try to vote in a new sandbox project, <laughs> <laughs> literally, right? Like, uh, the, you know, sometimes, uh, for example, we were looking at projects that is uh, plugins for VS Code or IntelliJ, and like, uh, what is uh, the cloud native stuff out there, yeah. right? And do we need to get them in? Is it going to be beneficial to the community? And is it going to improve the uh, developer experience. So those are some of the kinds that we think about. There's a debugging tool in the community. Is it cloud native? Uh, does it help uh, debug mm -hmm. cloud native applications? Then, you know, how much relevant is of, is it a side business of the project to debug cloud applications or is it the whole business, right? So we start looking at those kinds of things. So yes, the Google form is simple, but we do have to spend, each of us have to spend time on uh, looking through all the uh, things that, are, uh, that the project brings into the, our ecosystem. It's, and the other angle I also think always is, hey, uh, is there any common things uh, where Existing projects can go help out those new projects that are coming in, or the, you know, if there is good back and forth things happening, there's a good feedback loop happening, which will improve everybody together. So uh, th those are other kinds of things that I look for um, in addition to the definition of the cloud native itself. Do, anybody, anybody else wants to add to it? Do, do you think you'll ever update the definition again? Because I remember, you know, bless Brian, uh, Brian Grant's heart. I think he, he spent uh, a, a long time trying to push that through, and it took probably six plus months of, of 
I don't say bike shedding, but like collaboration <laughs> yes. to, to get so, something writ written down. I, I, I honestly think we should at some point, <laughs> and it's not here yet. Uh, and we are still trying to make sense of where we are and trying yeah. to build a complete picture for, for the people who are using. Yeah. So uh, the other thing about the mission statement also is um, the main thing that we have in mind to uh, get things across is a CNCF end user, mm. can they rely on the set of projects that we have and rely on the health of the projects that we have to build and sustain their own businesses, right? So that is the game that we are in, mm -hmm. and that's what we need to look at. Good. Cool. Thanks. No. Thanks, Joe. Good. Is that answer good? Um, okay, so <laughs> there's a lot of technical overlap these days between the CNCF, mm -hmm. the Continuous Delivery Foundation, mm -hmm. and OpenSSF. Mm -hmm. um, what can we do to have greater like, active collaboration and cooperation with those two other organizations? Uh, yeah, yeah, Emily, start with it. <laughs> So I, I'll start. So I obviously I'm on the talk, former security tag co-chair, but I am also becoming more and more active within the open source security foundation and a lot of the initiatives there because I've recognized we have a lot of overlap in activities. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, some of the work that our foundation has done has really kind of set the stage for how we can continue to move forward in that space. So having individuals that are really passionate about these specific domain areas take on leadership positions in both foundations. Yes, it's a lot of work, but it ensures that we're applying consistent messaging to all of the communities where our members will show up. Yeah. Um, so the other thing is, in, in the end, it's the people, right? Like who show up uh, in multiple spaces? Like you ask any, any one of us, everybody's wearing multiple hats. It means they're doing different things in different spaces at different levels. Uh, so in the end, it's the people that bring the rest of the people together, right? Like we can do something on a on a, a we need a regular meeting between OpenSSF, mm -hmm. TOC, and uh, our TOC or something like that too, right? We can do that, but it doesn't work as well as people trying to do things in both spaces that overlap and that complement each other. Um, so uh, a quick example here is like for the longest time, the Kubernetes uh, steering mm -hmm. has had a regular contacts with the OpenStack Foundation, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that is because people showed up from one to the other mm -hmm. and they were able to talk to each other and they were saying, hey, we are seeing, seeing similar kind of problems uh, and you are ahead of us, we are behind us and uh, there are some things that makes it easier for you and harder for the other person. So uh, it's the people that ends up bringing everybody together. So yes, we can mandate things on the, hey, regular meetings on the calendar, but if nobody shows up, it really doesn't matter, right? So that's that's my take on it. Yeah, and, and you know, from a Linux Foundation perspective, you know, people who come to us to start things and all this stuff, you, you know, you start your own organization with your toys and your little sandbox and scope naturally expands and, 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 and creeps up and there's overlap. And our goal is always to facilitate the conversations and if people want to merge or dissolve or us that we could accommodate that. But I think it's just, it's almost human nature to like want to start your own specific thing. Uh, it just happens the way the world works, un unfortunately. But we do our best to kind of enable that collaboration. I think you'll see more open SSF, CDF, CNCF kind of events over overlapping uh, in the future. We have about seven minutes left. So anyone, any else? Or we'll just go through the row of, row of folks now. Cool. I'll try and be as quick as possible. First off, um, super appreciate all the work you're doing. So thanks. Um, yeah. I guess on that note is I, I can obviously see by the screen how to get involved. Um, but one of the things that I am limited on is time. Mm -hmm. um, what do your like <laughs> schedules look like for being involved in the, in the TOC and the tags? Because uh, like I'm already swamped, but I really want to do this stuff. Um, how much time do you spend on this? Is it like just like occasional meetings or are you guys spending half of your life living in this stuff? The right question to ask is how much time of sleep that you get? <laughs> right, right now, like four hours. <laughs> uh, so anybody wants to take that question? 
So I've always tried to maintain 20% of my work is in the open source community, and there's been a few occasions where things slow down within the talk or within uh, the security tag, and that allows me to focus more on my regular day job, because I have one of those. Mm -hmm. And in other situations, like right before this conference, I'm spending significantly more time doing open source work. So it's a balance, yeah. and it's really up to you to figure out what's gonna work best for you, but you need to make mm -hmm. the time, and I think that's the biggest challenge. Maybe I'll, I'll just add something to that, but um, I would just say that it, it's time that will will pay back as well because you get a lot of exposure to a lot of projects, but also end users. Like doing due diligence for a project for incubation is super interesting. You will get in contact with a lot of people, interact with different different types of projects. So I I, I think it's something that definitely should be um, part of like your day job uh, mm -hmm. as much as possible. It, it shouldn't be like a side thing. I think as much as possible should should be recognized. Yeah. Sweet, thank you. Yeah, I think if in the ideal situation, if you could have your employer support a percentage of your time, that makes a world of a difference for, for, for sure. Some some people are as lucky to be in that situation. All right, next, next question. So, um, there's sort of two competing missions, right? Mm -hmm. Where you've got this mission to be have a big tent, right? Uh, be very inclusive. Mm -hmm. All all comers are welcome, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. under the tent. Mm -hmm. Then you've also got the standards and uh, the open standards mm -hmm. sort of mission. How do you each sort of balance those conflicting things? So let's say you've got two projects mm -hmm. that are in the same space, but they've got competing and sometimes conflicting APIs or protocols, how in both the due diligence process and incubation, all that, what are the types of conversations that you have to, to weigh those, those conflicting needs, I guess? I, yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. I think the answer to that is healthy competition. Uh, we have many projects within our ecosystem that are focusing on the same problem, but at the same time, they deliver it in a very different manner. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the process observability, we have Cortex and Thanos. If you think about GitOps, we have Argo City and Flux, mm -hmm. and this list can go on and on and on. The idea here is not to be exclusive. The idea here is we have different initiatives and they try to solve a problem in their own way with their own resources. However, over time, we see that we don't have a monopoly of like functionalities. We have this healthy competition, and when you have healthy competition, you have innovation by default. So I think we're trying to facilitate that as the TOCs and have that in mind. So just try to be as inclusive as possible, as long as it follows the cloud native mission, and as long as it follows that vendor neutrality and healthy community and contributors uh, and maintainers and so forth, they're gonna be welcome within our landscape. To do end okay. Go ahead. You seem like you had something to say. Uh, yes, I'm going to do the end user thing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I agree that that like it is good to have healthy competition and everything, but at the same time, uh, having too much competition leads to a situation where you have too much overlap, and it's super hard for end users to actually navigate this theme. And then you have those small islands or group of islands which are not fully compatible. My personal belief, but that's not TOC speaking. This is my personal <laughs> belief is that open standards should be a lot more driven throughout the Mm -hmm. I come from networking, so in ITF, working code speaks, uh, and that is what the defined interface is, and everyone else speaks this until they build something better which actually works. Yeah. That's the end user. So since Richie did the end user thing, I'll do the maintainer thing. I think <laughs> if I created a project in a space where a project already existed and CNCF said, this guy was here first and you don't adhere to their API, you are not welcome, that would be a really negative message. Mm -hmm. So. I don't necessarily view them as conflicting things. It's more a thing of as you move through the stages, it would be nice, like we've all talked about, to get closer to open standards. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's, I'll hesitantly use the word fair for lack of a better one, mm -hmm. to force that open standard as like a criteria for, for being welcome. We do encourage people to talk to each other and make sure that we provide a space for them to actually work through an issue or a problem. Dependencies can be shared, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, test suites can be shared. There's a bunch of things that can be done to improve collaboration. It's only when people, and then let people decide mm -hmm. together whether they want to do things separately or apart and which ones they want to do together, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, if you look at common examples, you had the container D rocket thing, the market eventually decided to standardize on container D and kind of Creo as the, the dominant solutions. Envoy Gateway announced this week is basically taking two projects and kind of merging it into Envoy. So these are like things that are driven long term based on end user and kind of vendor competition. It's not forced yeah. by the TOC. We'll have one more question and then I think uh, we'll close it out and then I'm sure you could try to catch everyone here. So one more question and then we'll r wrap it up. Hi. Um, so for the software delivery cycle for any software in the world, there are CI, CD, the production environment, observability, and so on. And I think CNCF did a very awesome job, like starting from CI, CD until the very end. But when it comes to the early stages of development for software engineers, like local development and all of that, I think that part specifically is, I guess, uh, suffering a little bit because of the like huge landscape that we have right now. So is there any direction inside the CNCF to make this a little bit smoother, especially for the early stages of the software development cycle before even the CI, CD, during the local development in, the, in, in that early stage? Anybody wants to take it? Yeah. I no? Okay. If you ask, are you referring to like like the IDE or like the local like development feedback loop? Are you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, like think of it as like someone who's not who's still working on the early version of the code locally on their own laptop. Like they are not even touching the CI CD yet. Okay, Katie. Okay. I think uh, there are already plenty of tools focusing on that. So you have like lightweight version of Kubernetes and you have multiple products for that. You have Kind, you have K3S, you can re like even KubeADM you can use that locally if you, if you really try. Um, so I think they're like, there are plenty of those at the moment. Um, however, I think it really depends where you'd like to focus on towards. Is it just like application deployment or if you like to integrate in different networking components or different storage? Uh, that becomes a bit more complicated and this is, um, mainly because you have different providers and like they require integration with the third party. So you cannot really do everything on your local machine. If it's just like, uh, if it's just like hello world, definitely very easy. If it's a bit more complicated, I think there's definitely something we need to improve. If you want to do it locally. So for example, let's play, talk about um, load balancer. If you want to kind of use a load balancer service, like there is, uh, there is a tool, kind of this my mind now. It's not metal free. Um, Metal LB, that's the one. Uh, so you can use that one, but even that one is like requires a bit of like tweaking and like making sure it works smoothly. So definitely an area for improvement when it comes to the next level of bootstrapping your application and not just you know have a container running locally. Okay. All right, uh, we're a little two minutes over over time. Uh, I want to thank the the TOC here for their their time. Uh, I want to just stress. Everyone is generally very accessible, even though everyone's a little bit busy. Feel free to reach out, send an email, Slack. Everyone generally will, will respond eventually. It's very kind of a great group of uh, folks we have up here, and you know they're here to kind of serve the community and, and advise. So thank you for your time. What? In the halls every day. Mm, yeah, yeah. Dims is pro hallway track, so it's, <laughs> all right. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. Sorry, just one more last thing. Shall we mention the election? Does yes, that uh, elections, elections, elections. Yeah, <laughs> final thing. So uh, yeah. we, uh, uh, Cornelia has stepped down, uh, you know, from the TOC. So this means we have an extra slot uh, opening and it's part of the governing board tranche of slots. So it means the governing board helps nominate and kind of vote on this. So if you're interested in potentially having an opportunity to uh, run uh, in this, uh, please reach out to me or any TOC members and we kind of walk you through uh, the process, but uh, it's fairly rare for this type of thing to uh, occur. These happen in tranches. Usually it's a, you know, a couple year uh, style uh, term. So um, that's an opportunity. So feel free to ping me or reach out to any folks and we'll, we'll help you with the, with the process. So um, thanks for the reminder there. Cool. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So.